I think that's the place we are in healthcare today. We're always looking for the root. And there is never one root. There is never one reason. We are complex beings with multifactorial instances that lead to our signs, our symptoms, and our diagnoses. We are talking about poop, constipation, mental health, anti-diet culture, all of the things in today's episode. Welcome back, guys, to the Digest This episode. I'm your host, Bethany Cameron, and today on the show, I have Andrea Nakayama. She is the founder of Functional Nutrition Alliance and leads thousands of students and practitioners around the globe in a revolution to offer better solutions to the growing chronic illness epidemic. By highlighting the importance of systems, biology, and root cause mythology, and therapeutic partnerships, she has helped thousands of people reclaim ownership of their health, and she's here today to share her knowledge with you all. But before we get into this episode, shout out to podcast listener Music with Gina Community. She wrote, I really love the podcast about the health benefits of cucumber juice. I have already been freezing my little cucumbers and adding them to my smoothies. Thank you for delighting and surprising us with your research and guidance, always with such care and kindness. Thank you so much for that review. And to everyone who goes and reviews and rates the podcast, it means so much to me. And if you haven't, I thoroughly do encourage you to do so. And I may read it on air. If you're not subscribed to my newsletters, they come out every Friday and they're called Friday Finds. This is information that only my subscribers get in their inbox. I share stuff like non-toxic air fryers and kitchen appliances, new food finds, product recalls, food news, and food products that aren't even on the market yet. But I've got the scoop. This is not published anywhere else and cannot be found on my blog. So be sure you're in the know and subscribe to my weekly newsletters by going to littlesipper.com slash subscribe and enter your email. That's all you have to do. So go to com forward slash subscribe to get exclusive information on everything food. Turns out everything you think you knew about probiotics may be wrong. It can get pretty confusing with the market saturated with probiotic everything. Let me give you my personal take and share what I got introduced to back in October. Seeds DS01 plant-based capsule is not only a probiotic, but a prebiotic. There are 24 strains of specifically formulated probiotics targeted for digestive health, gut immunity, as well as additional systemic benefits. There's actually a prebiotic capsule encapsulating the probiotic inside, which ensures that the probiotics actually make it to your colon with 100% survivability to do its job. Many think of pre and probiotics as only gut support. It does support the gut barrier, but Seeds DS01 also supports other areas of the body for whole body benefits, skin health, heart health, and micronutrient synthesis. Healthy regularity and an ease of bloating are just a few other common perks you may experience. So if you want something to help balance out your bowels and start a new healthy habit for the new year and your life, go to seed.com slash digest25 and use code digest25 to receive 25% off your first month of Seeds DS01 Daily Symbiotic. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you, Bethany. I'm so excited to be here with you. Yeah. So first, I have so many questions. I want to talk about poop. I want to talk about constipation. I want to talk about inflammation, sugar, just so many things. But before we get into that, why don't you introduce yourself and tell people a little bit about you and who you are and what you do? 
Yeah, thank you. I'm Andrea Nakayama. I'm a functional medicine nutritionist and I'm founder of the Functional Nutrition Alliance where I train about 3,500 practitioners a year from around the globe in the science and art of the functional medicine practice. And I'm also now turning my attention back to the patient, not as a clinician, but more as an educator helping people to find their way to health resolution especially when they're suffering with unresolved signs and symptoms. I love that. And, you know, it's so rare in today's day and age where people go to doctors and they just give them a prescription. They don't tell them what to do or how to solve the issue. They just give them a Band-Aid and say, take this and be on your way. And I love what you're doing is it's educating people so that they can take control of their own health. And so I can't remember where I heard this, but the best doctor is the doctor with no patients because they are educating their patients and they, you know, they don't need them anymore. Exactly. Exactly. And we've gotten further and further away from that, I think, because we're so anchored even in holistic, integrative and functional practices on the protocol. So what I see is a lot of people who have chronic health conditions and they may have been given a diet or lifestyle change, but it's too much to bite off at once. And so they end up down a road that's actually as much as a disservice to their physiological system as the thing they're trying to avoid because it causes a lot of stress. So I think we're in a really interesting place in the realm of healthcare, particularly when it comes to holistic health. It's hard for people to just kind of go all in or nothing. And I, I've had to do it myself just because of health reasons that I know others have as well, just because they were just in a dire state, cut and dry, cold turkey, did it, right? But a lot of people do have trouble just going all in. And I have a question is also, wh- why do we eat the way that we eat? It could be how we were brought up. It could be the lifestyle. But I think that plays into a factor of breaking habits and, and going all in. Yeah, I think, you know, when I answer this question from my perspective, and it's a functional nutrition perspective, so my uh, mantra is everything is connected, we are all unique, and all things matter. And when I also weave in my other passion, which is narrative medicine, we really take time to understand the story of the individual. So the reasons why we eat the way we do are everything. It's our sociological pressures, our cultural pressures or influences. It's our genetics. It's our microbiome. It's our habits. It's our family. It's everything. We can't really say this is the one reason. And again, I think that's the place we are in healthcare today. We're always looking for the root. And there is never one root. There is never one reason. We are complex beings with multifactorial uh, instances that lead to our signs, our symptoms, and our diagnoses. And those symptoms may be including how we eat. Right. Yeah. There is truly never one route, which I I feel like a lot of people think, yeah, there's this one root cause to their health issues, but more often than not, it's a combination of issues that bring on one health issue. So like, for example, if they have gut issues, it may not just because they are eating X, but probably because they are eating X, drinking Y, living a non-toxic environment, dealing with stress, not sleeping, like all the things, right? Yeah. So I have a lot of ways that I help people understand these things and thinking more globally. And what we're speaking to now, and I think it might be helpful for us to look at the primary tenets of a functional practice as well, but we're thinking into right now what I call three roots, many branches. So for those listening, we can think of any branch on the tree, if you envision a tree, as your signs, your symptoms, and your diagnoses. Those are branches. They're expressions of what's happening deeper below. If we get to the roots of any any chronic unresolved issue, they are always the genes or the genetic predisposition, digestion, 
and inflammation. Always, all three are gonna be active if we have chronic unresolved issues. And then what we do in functional nutrition is we look at the soil that those roots live in, the soil that feeds those roots. So we're not just saying, attack the branch or the leaves on the branch. We're not even saying, let me find the root, there's this test, or now I've put a label on it. We're saying always these three roots. And if we look at the soil that those roots live in, and I haven't, you know, the soil identified for each root, then we are able to make sustainable changes that last a longer period of time, as opposed to the target practice that we've fallen into these days. Wow, that's amazing. And again, can you list those three roots? Yes, they're the genes or the genetic Mm -hmm. predisposition, Mm -hmm. the digestion, and inflammation. And each of those areas, when we think about them, leads us to a field of scientific study that helps us to understand that. So for instance, our genes, as many of us know now, are not a blueprint that we don't have influence over. We don't necessarily have control over these things, but we have influence with epigenetic factors, and that's food, movement, environment, and mindset. And that's going to be different for each person. I, as a functional medicine nutritionist, can't tell you this is the food we should all eat for good health because it's going to be different for you, Bethany, than it's going to be for me. And that's a process of investigation. It's not a handout. Yeah, no, I love it. We are all unique and and individualized. And for those two that think, well, these are just my genes, this is how it is, you can definitely change that. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's where we have, I like to call it the circle of influence. And that's based on the work of Stephen Covey, who talks about when we're trying to control or we don't know what to do, how that produces anxiety. But when we find our circle of influence, so if you're visualizing this, you can visualize a circle in the center, an orbit surrounding that circle, and then the ether beyond. So if we try to go into the control factor or we're in the ether, we are usually in a place of anxiety or unknowing. If we come into that place of orbit, that's our circle of influence. And the circle of influence for the root is our soil or terrain. And again, for our genes, we have that epigenetic circle of influence. Those are the factors that like kind of wash or influence our genes and their food, movement, environment, and mindset going to need our attention, but be different for each and every one of us. For instance, in thinking about food, I would give that a circle of influence and say that we have to be thinking about quality, quantity, diversity, and timing. And again, different for each and every one of us based on access to food, access to quality, access to diversity, as well as what our body needs at that individual time. So it's really like I'm double clicking and opening the box of what nutrition really means beyond saying, eat this, don't eat that. For someone as an individual, what are some tips to find the root cause of their own health issues? So I think we get into a place where we're searching for the root as if that's going to give us the solution. And I think this creates what I call the cycle of chronic illness. And that can get us into a trap where we think finding the root or the roots is going to make us feel better. And this is the challenge I see so many people go through because once they find that diagnosis, so to speak, it doesn't necessarily get them all better. If we think more broadly about how do I nourish my soil, then we actually find our way there and we are partners as patients in our healthcare. So I'm speaking really theoretically. The way I would talk about this practically is that each and every one of us needs to find our non-negotiables. And our non-negotiables are related to all aspects of our lives. We can think through sleep and relaxation, exercise and movement, nutrition and hydration, stress and resilience, relationships and networks. It may be that 
ha- being, you know, a non-negotiable is having more joy or laughter in our lives. And we're depriving ourselves of that as we're on this sympathetic dominant quest for better health and finding the root, right? We can't heal in that state. And so I like to invite people to think more broadly versus the target, we can still be looking for that target, that root, or what's my problem? Is it Lyme? Is it mold? Is it estrogen dominance? Do I have this autoimmune condition? What's going on? But what we do in the meantime is broaden our focus and really tap into ourselves and our own personal non-negotiables so that when we show up in our quest with our medical providers, we actually have a lot more information. I always like to say when you see your doctor, there are two experts in the room. They may have medical expertise, but only you are the expert in you. And the only way you become the expert in you is by tuning into these broader factors as opposed to playing target practice based on a social media post or a blog article that make you suspect and self-diagnose. I feel like mental health is so important and it really does start in the mind because if you're not determined to make the change mentally, you're not going to make the change physically. It, It all starts with that decision in your mind and Just from your experience in your practice, what are the most common uh, causes of mental health issues in patients that you see? So a lot of times I think that there's a tremendous amount of noise in the healthcare space that's causing its own form of stress for, for a lot of folks who are struggling. So there's then a lot of anxiety, a lot of don'ts, can'ts, and shouldn'ts that lead to a lot of guilt, shame, and regret, which are not conducive to the healing process. And so one of the things that I've been looking at with my case study group for the book that I'm writing, which is geared towards the patient, is what we're telling ourselves when we say, I know what I should be doing and I'm not doing it. What does that phrase mean? And what does it do to our state of mental health? So I would counter that if you're telling yourself, I know what I should be doing and I'm not doing it, that you may not actually have all the information about why you should be doing that thing. And that's not your fault. You need some more education that helps you connect the dots that help you see how that change of behavior is going to impact uh, your ability to make that change. So I think we put a lot of pressure on behavioral change without understanding what it might actually take for us to make that change. It might be pacing. It might be more information or understanding. It might be really feeling a difference in your body. And again, this comes back to the true narrative of each of us as patients, our stories, and we're bypassing that in favor of looking for the fix as if we're broken and we're not. And like you said, people do need to know why they're doing X, Y, or Z because without them just saying, oh, like someone so-and-so just told me to do this to fix it. But why? Exactly. Exactly. And why for me? So I think that there's a lot of information out there that takes us into the very left brain area of the biochemistry or here's what's happening. But what does that mean for me as an individual? And how do I actually find that information so I can correlate that physiological story, that biology story with my biology so that I'm motivated. Every change we make is a risk reward conversation. And we don't make the change until the risk is so high that we recognize what we need to do. And we have to be in that dialogue with ourselves. What's the reward I get from, let's say, eating something that I'm sensitive to, right? So for me, I will just say, and I'm not making a blanket statement, but I will say I don't eat gluten because I have an autoimmune condition and I understand the connections and can feel them in my body, not digestively, but with my overall immune function. But the risk of eating gluten 
is something I'm aware of, the reward of partaking in a family gathering where gluten is being eaten may be bigger for a person in one moment than the risk. And so how do we recognize that reward and opt in for the benefits of the reward without partaking in the risk? So As an example, for me, that would be I can opt in and make sure there's something for me to eat, cake, pie, cookies, that I can eat. So I'm still partaking in the part that feels rewarding without partaking in the risk. And that's a journey in every single decision, risk, reward, that we're overstepping in favor of the fast movement, which like you said... There are situations, I certainly went through this with my husband's brain tumor, there are situations where we need to act fast. And then there are some situations, most for those of us with chronic illness, that may be a fast action and then a marathon or may just be a marathon, not a sprint. And it's really good to, just speaking from my own experience as well, it's a trial and error. For example, like you gave the the family gathering, you know, maybe at the beginning you say, okay, well, I'll, I'll just partake. And then after a few times of getting sick or not feeling so well for, you know, for, at least for me, it would take sometimes two weeks to recover from just something I ate. And so now I'm like, it's not even worth two weeks of just feeling like crap, you know? And so I don't feel like I'm missing out not eating because I know I'm going to feel better. And that is the, the knowledge that everyone has to, I would say, unfortunately, go through and experience that time of illness to say, hey, I don't want to feel like that again. Exactly. And I want to recognize that I do work with a lot of people who have done all the things and they didn't get all the way better. So they basically say, forget it all. And then they're on a different journey that is uh, not serving them physiologically because the heightened restriction, again, didn't serve them psychologically. And so that becomes a journey that we have to pay heed to as much as the protocols that are out there for what is the ideal way to support the body in its healing process. Mm. And what do you tell that person that it has tried all the things and they're still not better. And they're like, oh, forget it. I'm just going back to my old ways. Or maybe someone listening, it's not them. Maybe it's a family member and they're trying to encourage them. What what would you tell that person? I think this is a really a part of holding space for that experience. And it's not just a one thing to say. It's recognizing what they've done in the past that worked, what worked about that, what did they feel during that journey, and what did they not feel. And helping people to understand that, I like to think of it as an infinity loop. There are the items outside of us, the food, the recommendations, and then there's the its impact internally. So I can't say coffee is good or bad, or red wine is good or bad, or dairy is good or bad. It's how that thing interacts in your body, and we might need to do more work internally to heal the system so that it can tolerate more. And oftentimes those two things aren't done. We're only removing we're not replacing, we're not re-inoculating, we're not repairing, we're only removing, which is a recipe for um, deprivation, disillusion, because we've not put salt in the wound, but we haven't done anything about the wound. So I think it's a longer conversation about holding that person's reality as opposed to pushing them to do what we know is right. And we know this is the protocol that will work, but not recognizing that it's not working for them. I would call that medical gaslighting because there's a personal's person's experience with having done things before that needs to be brought to the forefront before we are just pushing protocols on them. Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit too about mental health and the role that sugar plays with our mental health. 
Yeah, it's huge. I mean, for me, when we talk about those non-negotiables, I have a non-negotiable trifecta and it's sleep, poop, and blood sugar balance. And if we don't have those things in place and we're trying to solve for those branches, we miss the opportunity to actually find true sustainable healing. So again, sleep, poop, and blood sugar balance are what we might need to focus our attention on versus the sign symptom diagnosis. You can name it, migraines, infertility, PCOS, mold, Lyme, anything, all the autoimmune conditions. These are chronic conditions, but we have to come back to those non-negotiables. And that blood sugar balance impacts everything, not just our mental health, but it impacts every aspect of our systems, our digestive system, our immune system, the way we're able to repair from oxidative stress or free radical damage, our detoxification, certainly our hormones, which impact our mental health. So when we think about blood sugar imbalances, and that's not necessarily related to just sugar, that's a physiological response, we need to really recognize the impact that those swings in our blood sugar caused by refined sugar or not can have on all body systems. Again, everything is connected. We're all unique and all things matter. Yeah. Would you say that sugar is the top three inflammatory foods? I would definitely consider refined sugar as one of the top three inflammatory foods for most individuals and um, something we have to look at with care and compassion. What's the risk reward? Where is this coming in? What are you attached to in that food or that activity? And how can we look at making a change? Do you understand why and how this is impacting you? Multiple studies point to a link between dehydration and a higher risk of anxiety and depression. And if you have low levels of electrolytes, it can cause anxiety or panic-like symptoms. Some of the most common causes of electrolyte imbalance are due to fluid loss. Adding electrolytes is a great way to replenish and rebalance your body, mind, and mood. However, most electrolyte drink mixes contain added gums, sugars, colors, and even added oils. I'm really picky about what goes into my body. So that's why I choose Elements Raw Unflavored Electrolyte Mix. Elements Unflavored Version contains a science-backed electrolyte ratio of salt, magnesium, and potassium. Those three simple ingredients are in their raw unflavored packs. So whether you just finished a workout, sauna session, or just need to hydrate for your mental health, Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited for those following a keto, low-carb, vegan, or paleo diet. And right now, Element is offering my listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packets free with any Element order. Element also has a no questions asked refund policy. So if you try it, don't like it, they will give you your money back guaranteed, no questions asked. So you have nothing to lose. Just go to D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash digest to get this amazing offer. Now, for someone that's just truly addicted to sugar or just can't go without, what are some tips to still enjoy sugar without impacting our hormones and brain chemistry? Well, I always, again, you're going to hear me talk into a lot of systems and phrases because I like to give people things to remember. So the way that I think about addressing our sugar or sweet tooth is with fat, fiber, and protein. And so if we remember to eat fat, fiber, and protein 
every time we are consuming food, we are starting to mitigate the impacts of the sugar. So are there ways to remove sugar? Yeah, I've been working with that for like 20 years with people in terms of how do we remove sugar from the diet if we don't want to be eating it? And how do we look at the whys behind our cravings, which again, could be in the gut, could be in the immune system, could be in our energy balance or our um, iron levels. There's a lot of things that could drive our uh, cravings for sugar. But how do we crowd that out with alternatives and remember every time I eat, if I eat fat, fiber, and protein, I'm going to have a more sustainable response in my body that has me craving less and make sure to feed the sweet tooth because the mind needs the sweet tooth. The tongue needs the sweet tooth. We don't want to deprive ourselves of sweetness in life. Yeah. And I mean, the more someone does remove sugar from their diet, the the less they crave it. I can speak, you know, I, I don't need sugar at all in my chocolate. I eat a hundred percent chocolate. I don't, you know what I mean? I don't add any sugar. If I bake, it, it's like bananas or the the sweetness in whatever I'm baking. And it's enough for me after years of just removing it. Um, and that's not to say I don't enjoy honey and things like that. But, you know, when you do truly remove sugar, refined sugar, it completely ta- uh, changes your taste buds and a strawberry tastes 10 times sweeter. Yes, absolutely. As long as we don't have other factors that are driving the craving or the need, like a fungal overgrowth, for instance, that feeds off of sugar that are directing us and then making us potentially feel like a failure because we can't reach that point where we can only use bananas or strawberries. And I'm like you, Bethany, like for me, I don't have that much of a sweet tooth and I prefer the natural sweeteners. Um, I watched my son when he was in high school, when he was working with his acne, he's about to graduate college now. But when he was dealing with acne, he read somewhere, you know, you know, having to find his own journey, even though it's our kind of religion, nutrition in the house. But he read about the impacts of hydration and about moving, removing sugar. So he put an app on his phone where he tracked his hydration and he removed all sugar. And to this day, you know, over probably eight years later, he just doesn't have a sweet tooth because like you, he removed it and then doesn't crave it. And what I find is that that it's harder for some than others. And I want to give grace to those who may need a little bit more of the internal work, not just with their mental health, but with their body, with their physiology to help them get to that point. And again, if we eat the fat fiber protein, if we crowd out sweets and don't deprive ourselves of the sweet sensation, we're going to have more success and it's going to look different for each and every one of us. For sure. For sure. And you mentioned hydration and how important is hydration for, let's just say blood sugar, because if if you're not drinking water, that's, I mean, that's most of what your body is. Absolutely. And I think we overstep this important uh, or we bypass this important step in health. A lot of people will have a lot of symptoms and they're not recognizing hydration. So I could look at somebody's labs and tell from their red blood cells, normal labs, that they're not getting enough water and start to make correlations between their energy and fatigue, their iron levels, their ferritin levels, the functioning of their heart and their ability to pump blood to the heart. There's so many ways that hydration is serving our bodies and our brains, and it is often overlooked. We kind of bypass that in favor of the fancy route or diagnosis. And this is really what I'm all about at this moment. Even if we find that root or that diagnosis, we still have to hydrate. We're not going to get better with the protocols for the diagnosis if we don't do our core basics and recognize those non-negotiables, unfortunately. 
Yeah. And there's actually been studies as well that um, there's higher anxiety in people that are dehydrated. Good point. So it, it really does affect just our mental health, anxiety and depression, the, those that just don't drink enough water. Uh, it, there's been studies to show that. So it's just, it affects so much, including our poop and constipation. And so let's talk about poop for a second. And what is the perfect poop? <laughs> mm, yeah, I mean, I I actually was doing a little writing about poop recently, and I had uh, I put out a call for people to ask me all their poop questions, and uh, there are a lot of poop questions, and I think we need to think of form function and frequency. So in relation to form, there is an ideal that feels like on the Bristol stool chart, you know, something that would look full and like a log and be a right color. But then I find people can get caught up in chasing the perfect poop. So again, we certainly need hydration and then we need that fat fiber protein makeup to see what's going on in there. We also need digestive support. So some people might need internal work to get to the perfect poop. So in terms of the form, we want a log and we want it to be brown in color, not too light or too dark. And we want to feel good when we release it, like it can come out easily without urgency and also without strain. We're talking poop. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, that my, that's what my listeners want. That's what they're here for, you know, digestion and all that good stuff. Um, so how often should we have a bowel movement? And um, if people aren't going every day, what are your tips to getting regular and staying regular? Yes. Yeah, so um, the ideal is to go three times a day, one to three times a day. And when I say ideals, I want to always recognize that there's a journey from heal to ideal. Oftentimes we go and think about the ideal and we're holding ourselves to that ideal. And when we can't achieve that, that's when we peace out of the situation. So recognizing that it might take some work, that fat fiber protein is going to help us get there that's going to be different for every individual. Somebody who hasn't been eating a lot of fiber or who reacts digestively to fiber is going to say, that doesn't work for me. And so again, this is a very individualized journey. And while I could say something like fat fiber protein, different people are going to have different abilities to digest protein. That's our upper digestive system. And if we don't have that in good repair, we're going to have problems down the line in the lower digestive system and in the colon. If we can't digest fats, let's say we don't have a gallbladder or we have difficulty digesting fats because of intestinal issues, that also is going to impact what do we mean by fat. And again, like I said, fiber is complicated. It might be a journey of stepping it up bit by bit while doing some internal healing. So I'll share that when I met my uh, boyfriend five years ago, he could only eat chicken, rice, and oatmeal. And he would watch me eat a big bowl of veggies and be like, I wish I could eat that. And he's super healthy looking, works out really hard, very muscular and lean. And I was like, why can't you eat veggies? And slowly he started to reveal that like couldn't eat onions, couldn't eat garlics, had bloating. And so I was like, oh, okay, I know I can project what's going on in there. I don't want him to be my client. I'm not trying to take him on as a client, but he asked me for some help. And we did some things to help support the health of his digestive system, top to bottom. Now he can eat whatever he wants, including things that I, you know, wouldn't ideally want him to eat, but he can eat anything and eats a big salad every single day and doesn't shy away from any foods at all. It took time and it took the healing internally before the inclusion of the food. So I just want to recognize again, I can say fat, fiber, protein, but that fiber quotient along with the fat 
and the protein is going to be different for each person depending on their internal terrain and what kind of support that needs. So hydration, fat, fiber, protein. If we are not going every day, there's usually something internal that needs our support. And there might be uh, some mucosal healing that needs support. There might be some microbiome healing that needs support. And it's going to be different for each and every individual. So Bethany, while I could give you some like how to's, I always refrain from doing that in a situation where people aren't seen as an individual. So you will never hear me give a recommendation for a supplement or a protocol in a public situation because I don't believe that's how health works. I think it's very individual. No, I, th- I, I really honor that and I appreciate that uh, because everyone is individual and there's so many listeners and everyone has something different. And you had talked about fiber. And for me personally, I don't do a high fiber diet because fiber just does not agree with me. I am very aware of what I put in my body and I tend to stick with a lower fiber and honestly, a a lower carb diet works for me as far as staying regular, as well as uh, keeping yeast and fungal overgrowth, you know, at bay and all of that. Um, so I tend to do a lower, not not like keto, but a lower carb, where then other people may need higher carbs and less fat. Um, you know, so again, it's all individualized, and if someone. I mean, doctors, it's so often that they just tell their patients, just eat more fiber, take Metamucil, take this, take a psyllium husk, whatever. And the patient just gets worse, you know, and because they're going from zero to a hundred. And when you up fiber super quickly, that for anyone, even if you're used to fiber, if you just up at 50 grams or whatever, it's going to mess you up. Yeah, exactly. I've done that before too, where I'm like, whoa, this is not, this is too much at once. So yeah, it's a very individualized relationship with, again, that infinity loop. We can say fiber, but fiber exists outside of the body. When we put fiber inside the body, that's where we learn about your body. And you know, this doesn't work for me. Non-negotiable, I don't eat these things. This doesn't work. If I were to create the parameters around how we should think about food, it would be that fat, fiber, protein. Again, unique ratios for each of us, depending on whether that fiber comes from veggies or grains or fiber supplements or whatever works or doesn't work, recognizing that, which will come to our third principle. The second principle is to eat the rainbow. So as much diversity as we can get gives us a lot of the nutrients we need. And that third principle is your own yes, no, maybe list. And I think we're often engaging in dietary protocols before we even know what's true for ourselves. And Bethany, you know what's true for you. And that was a journey, as you said. And I think a lot of what's happening and that's leading to the anti-diet culture, which is actually an anti-dieting culture, is the rush to what we think is going to be the fix in the diet that isn't appropriate for us. People are going keto or intermittent fasting when that's not right for their their body in this moment in time for various reasons that they don't understand. Diet and lifestyle are their own quote unquote medicine and we're putting it in the hands of a patient to try to figure out and it's confusing. And I'm sorry for that as a nutritionist. I'm really sad that that's what's happening and then turning people against the powers that food can have to help us on our journey. Yeah. And you you did mention the anti-diet culture, which I feel like, you know, (laughs) it's not... It's. I think it's gone too far, in my personal opinion. And now people are like anti diet. I'm gonna eat the Doritos, you know, like love yourself. And I just feel like in, in today's day and age, if you're eating 
a well-balanced, healthy diet, that's actually considered dieting. You know, because in, in today's society, we're eating so much junk food that eating just clean food is now like considered dieting, which is like crazy to me. Yeah, it's become very polarized like everything else where I think that diet and lifestyle modification have been put in the hands of doctors and social media influencers where it's out there as a fix and as a handout or a blog article. And that has caused a confusion that we're then having a backlash to. And I truly think that food can be medicine. It can also be toxic. Again, not just in the form of a food stuff that isn't actually food, but also in the form of our relationship to those diets and to those restrictions. That's toxic too. And so I see a place for both of what's happening. And I'm going to be centrist in this particular situation and say like, yeah, there's truth. It's true, but partial in both areas. And we have to come to a different way of looking at it, which includes and highlights the individual. And that's what's missing in both those conversations. When we go anti-diet culture, eat whatever you want, I'm on Instagram licking ice cream. I'm sorry, if you have a, a you know, a lactose intolerance or an issue with casein or whey, the proteins in dairy, that's not body positivity when you're doing that. That's a big middle finger to your body, to your very own body. And so it's a complicated conversation and moment we're in, in relation to nutrition. For sure. Yeah. You're actually doing your body a disservice when you are doing that because you know it's not going to serve your body right. And I think when people do go on diets, I'm I'm definitely not um, anti-diet you know, because as long as they're doing it for the right reasons, if they want to get healthy, if they want to do it for the right reasons, if they want to whatever, lower their blood sugar or just be healthier, uh, go for it. If in, and if you're dieting in a very healthy way, then you're all for it. But it, it can go on both ends of the spectrum, just kind of overboard. And so you need to to find that middle ground and you need to really find the why I'm doing this. Yes. Why am I doing this? And am I actually in that risk reward relationship, listening to myself all the time so that my restriction isn't causing me to then buck against the restriction to the point where I then I'm swinging between these polarities for myself, which also does not serve anybody mentally or physically. And so I think there's a slow down, a close listening that leads us to that why that you mentioned, Bethany. Yeah. And um, I, I kind of want to go back just a little bit to the constipation topic here. And also, please correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I feel that if someone is constipated as well, something that's maybe not um, directly related to food, and maybe sometimes people forget, is if if you're not in a parasympathetic state and if you're like, go, 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 always like hyped, I feel like your body can't relax and actually evacuate. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is true of any healing. Like I was saying before, if we're stuck in that sympathetic dominant state, which is our fight or flight state, there's a lot that our body can't do. Eliminate, like you're talking about, reproduce, rest, and digest, right? So we can't get into that rest and digest, which is the parasympathetic, when we're stuck in that sympathetic state. I feel like the term nervous system is thrown around a lot these days. I hear like yoga people, you like, this is for your nervous system. And when we're talking about that, we're talking about that rest and digest or that fight or flight and how we move between those. There's a place for each. There's nothing wrong with striving and achieving, but we need to allow ourselves to come into that parasympathetic 
And what I see, Bethany, with so many people who are sick and not getting better is they're stuck in that sympathetic dominant state, which is not only in relation to their entire orientation to life, but also their quest for that answer. Why is this happening? Give me the reason. I'm going to spend money on tests, on pills, on protocols, on practitioners, and I'm not finding it. I'm not finding it. I'm not finding it. I'm not finding it. And I'm all for the quest for answers while also supporting ourselves with what we can do on our own, which comes back to some more basics than taking a lot of supplements or doing things that are more targeted. Again, it's that soil thinking, that terrain thinking versus that branch thinking. Yeah. I mean, stress plays a huge role. And I mean, yeah, I can, this may be a little TMI, but I'm just going to share. But if I need to go to the restroom and I am wired still, or I'm doing work or I'm doing this or that, there's no way I need to like detach myself, just whatever, browse Instagram or, you know, surf the the internet or just take a step outside. And I need to relax and get myself in that rest and digest mode. And immediately I'll be able to go to the restroom, but you got to switch it off. Yeah, absolutely. Never TMI when it comes to poop. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, you know, um, but it's, there's a lot of like you said, there's a lot of different pieces to the puzzle and it's typically not a one one fix cure all type of thing. There was this person too, they had cancer and I think they just went off grid. There's been like people and, and stories and they went off grid, they went in the wilderness, no contact with social media, whatever, and their cancer just like randomly just went away, you know, just from de-stressing, detaching, And eczema, I know that too. A lot of people, skin flare-ups, when they just take the noise away, like you were saying, they can heal. Yeah, it's there's spontaneous healing throughout history and we can strive for that too. And when we think of that global terrain and recognize, like you're saying, the importance of stress, it's in my area, my right side of my matrix. You know, I have a matrix that helps us see everything is connected. We are all unique. All things matter. And that all things matter is sleep and relaxation matter. Exercise and movement matter. Nutrition and hydration matter. Stress and resilience matter. Relationships and networks matter. And so even focusing on one of those areas and not all of them at once and saying, I'm going to look at how I support the stress in my life because I can't move to the woods. I can't get a converted van and travel. That That's my TMI fantasy. Like I can't travel the world in a converted van, right? So what can I do to feed the part of me that needs to tune out, that needs a cradle of restoration? And they can be little things. It doesn't mean I meditate five minutes a day. I do a lot of things in five to 10 minute increments to give my body what it needs without taking on this idea that I'm going to climb Mount Everest in a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Great tips. And some people, they may be discouraged as far as the time it takes them to heal. Like you, you were talking about when you had lunch with that guy and you know, now he can eat whatever. How long did it take him to, to get to that point? Yeah. And he wasn't even somebody I would consider like my usual client, right? I tend to work with a lot of women who have been there, done that through my practice, through the years that I've been, um, have our clinic and my practice that are really struggling with major symptoms. His symptom was just digestive distress that he didn't want. And as a engineering brain male, he had just removed what didn't work for him. In doing so, he's going to have more health issues down the line if he doesn't resolve that because a very limited restricted diet leads to its own nutrient deficiencies, right? So what we did, again, was focus 
I, for years, like two years, just on things that he brought into his smoothies that helped with uh, what he was able to tolerate. We shifted some things. Talk about crowd out. He was eating oatmeal every morning with brown sugar and skim milk. That's a very high glycemic meal. So lots of sugar to the bloodstream, because if we look at low fat milk as an example, it's a processed food because we've taken something good out of the food that exists in the food that actually slows its glycemic response, the way our blood sugar responds. So we just made changes to that where he used his oatmeal with a uh, raw honey, which has other healing benefits, and an almond milk. And he made that change and he was happy to do it. And then other things that we brought in that supported the healing of his gut. And I would say like two years and event, gradually he was able to eat more and more till he was able to eat everything and not have any issue. I mean, when we first started dating, I had to think about what I was going to make for a meal just based on chicken and rice. And I don't eat the rice because I don't eat a lot of grains. And now I don't think about it at all when I cook for us. Mm, yeah, I love that. It's such a, an encouraging story too, because there are so many people that are suffering, I'm sure, uh, more severely than, than he was. And so two years for him, and for someone that's in a more dire state, it may take four years. I mean, so I, I'm saying this to encourage anyone listening that it's not going to be in a month. You right. know, maybe, could be. Right. But and it's not all one trajectory. So I always use the the analogy of Mount Everest because he is a climber and I've now like hasn't climbed Mount Everest, but I've now like watched every Everest climbing video documentary movie that exists. And it's a great analogy because it takes weeks to get to base camp. Not even everybody can acclimate to get to base camp. And then there's a journey of going to the next camp seeing if you can tolerate it, going back down to acclimate, going back up, going back down, going back up, staying there. Can you acclimate? Can your lungs acclimate? Going to the next base camp. So that is the journey. And when we recognize what a feat it is to climb Mount Everest, that's akin to our health journey. And if we can bite it off in those ways, as instead of expecting it's going to happen overnight or that one test or diagnosis or protocol is going to get us there and instead recognize those people that summit Mount Everest have worked for years before they even fly there to get to base camp. Yeah. Yeah. Just some encouragement for those too. You know, it will take a while. So just keep on plucking away. On. <laughs> yeah. You got to keep on keeping on. That's for sure. Um, and, you know, thinking about it, I love, again, what you're doing to educate people. And I feel like it's so sad that doctors don't actually go through nutrition school. And I believe it's only like 15 to 20 hours total of, of nutrition education. Is that correct? It is. It I is. mean, so it's, it's crazy. They go through, I don't know how many thousands of hours. 70, th like thousands, tens of thousands. That's, that's ridiculous. And then only 15 to 20 hours of nutrition education. Correct. And so I just want people to really let that sink in because nutrition can really, I believe, solve a lot of different issues that many are going through. Yeah. Yeah. And we may know more. So a lot of times to that point, Bethany, I find that patients are looking for approval from their doctors about things that they're wanting to change with their diet or lifestyle modification. And when the doctor says that doesn't matter, they then are in conflict with that. And I want to say like, Go to your doctor for what your doctor knows about. I'm not discounting the expertise of our doctor, but we don't ask our doctor what deodorant to use, what toothpaste to use, what vacuum cleaner to get, which sheets we should get. Like we're asking them something that's completely out of their realm of expertise because unless they're trained in it, they're not trained in it, <laughs> unless they went for extra training. So recognizing that we don't need their approval 
for how we eat, save for if we're concerned about a medication we're taking or the interaction between an herb or a supplement and a medication. Those are the things we need to bring to our medical providers. But I think we're looking for their approval where they're not actually the ones equipped to give us the approval. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you don't go to a chiropractor and ask them about your your skin conditions. Correct. Thank you so much for just sharing your knowledge with my listeners. And this was so educational. I hope everyone gets something uh, out of it. And where can people find you? Pimp yourself out. What's your social? All that good stuff. Everything is Andrea Nakayama. So the website's andreanakayama.com. That will lead you back to the work and my training for practitioners at the Functional Nutrition Alliance, to my podcast, The 15-Minute Matrix, to all the socials, everywhere. It's Andrea Nakayama, all A's, a lot of them, and uh, easier to spell than you think. (laughs) Well, thank you again for coming on. Thank you, Bethany. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digest This. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a review in your podcast app to let us know. If you're ever wondering how you can support me and this podcast, sharing it with your friends and family is the best way. This is a Resonant Media production produced by Drake Peterson and edited by Chris McCone. To email the show, message us at digestthispod at gmail.com. See you next time. The content of this show is for educational and informational purposes only. It is not a substitute for individual medical and mental health advice and does not constitute a provider-patient relationship. As always, talk to your doctor or health team first. Looking to build a more robust foundation in your health and well-being? From the producer of Digest This comes one of the most popular alternative health shows on Apple Podcasts, The Dr. Tina Show. Dr. Tina Moore is a naturopathic physician and chiropractor, traditionally and alternatively trained in science and medicine. The show features exclusive interviews with experts such as Sean Stevenson, Mike Mutzel, Mark Groves, and even solo episodes covering metabolic health, pharmaceuticals, chronic diseases, long hauler syndrome, and pain management. Dr. Tina delivers the information in a no-nonsense, real-world style, and she has the science to back it up. The Dr. Tina Show is edgy, entertaining, and informative. Every episode will leave you with a new pearl of health wisdom to expand your knowledge base. When you're empowered, you can do better for yourself, your family, and your community. Resilience is the name of the game, and Dr. Tina is here to guide you on your way. Listen to The Dr. Tina Show today on your favorite podcast app. New episodes every Wednesday. Produced by Drake Peterson and Resident Media.